welcome back to the talk with Connie. I am here with my friend Don Schiller, who is a survivor of um, human trafficking. And wow, what a story, Don, you have. The story is really about you know survival and overcoming, and um, you know, and and my book is about you know who I was at the time that made me so um, made me look available to somebody who was a predator and a pedophile. My family was um, my father was just come back from the Vietnam War and he was changed um, but he was also a heavy drinker and he left us for a long time in a really bad neighborhood and then finally came back and um, you know he he took my daughter my sister and myself to um, California we hitchhiked across the, the country and picked up a hitchhiker in, in uh, Colorado I believe and he uh, just said well hey if you take me all the way to California if you take us all the way to California, then I will, um, you know, you can stay at my girlfriend's house. So we went to Glendale, California, and he asked his girlfriend if we could stay there. And she said, let me just ask the manager. And the manager happened to be John Holmes. And in your book, um, I'm not going to give much away of your book, but there was the dialogue. What was your first dialogue like that maybe she could have raised a red flag had you been older? With me and John? It's like uh, he asked you a question. Yeah, he would ask questions like, you know, how old are you? And then, you know, act like he was so shocked that I was 15 because I was 15 and he was 32. And he was already living this life of, um, see, you know, this porn life at night. And in the daytime, he was a um, uh, the manager of the apartment complex. And, you know, I was 15 year old kid. I didn't know anything about porn. At the, this was 1976, mind you. We didn't have the exposure to the internet and all the pornography that probably younger than 15 years old today um, are have access to. So I was pretty naive, very naive, as a matter of fact. And we were poor and we didn't have food. <laughs> He started supplying food. He started bring, you know, bringing odd jobs in. He started, uh, we became dependent on him for going to the store, going to the, you know, to um, you know, anywhere else where we needed anything, going to the laundromat, wherever we had to go. Um, he also put himself in charge of giving us tours around Los Angeles. And so he, he thought, you know, and he started to act like this protector kind of carer of this family that was you know had a disabled veteran father and these kids who didn't have any food but he was also the marijuana guy too you know and in the 70s i smoked marijuana in this neighborhood before my father came back because it was a really that's just what we did i mean it was uh, not a good neighborhood it wasn't really um you know everybody came from a pretty much a broken home back there but but you know so my and my father smoked marijuana and he used it a lot for the pain that he had because he had of the loss of part of his face from agent orange so um you know so he came and he, he was always the guy the supplier of marijuana for my father and that also had my helped my father look the other way um why other people in that apartment complex look the other way i don't know but he started to um you know just wake me up for school are you home and you know little jealousies began to happen like oh if i didn't come home from school right away and mind you i just started the 10th grade in a new state and you're 15. I'm 15. I didn't know anybody. Yeah. And, and I was trying to make friends. And so I remember staying at over, uh, after school at a friend's house. And, uh, so I came home late, but I didn't know that John had been waiting for me to come home. He had timed me. And when I came home late, he was very upset. So he didn't bring food for weeks. He didn't bring food for days and, and told me, you know, that uh, some story that I, that I started to believe that, you know, it was important to come back because he was worried and how dare I make him so upset. And, he just cared about us and so he put all that guilt on my shoulders and then my sister didn't eat either and my sister was a year younger and i felt very responsible for her but it took him about six months before he um he was able to seduce me and make me believe that he cared so much that he uh, he was a boyfriend and again the whole idea of him being in this porn world which i i, I you know I, I couldn't even fathom what that looked like because i had no visual um visual imagery to anchor that what it was so it was this like Kind of a blank and he always said oh it's not important i don't care about that and never would talk about it a lot and the same thing with his wife who was a pediatric um nurse who um who the, he says oh we're, we've just been brothers and you know living like brothers and sisters for a long time we're just really really good friends and it was the 70s you believed stuff like that happened because you just went okay plus we were kids we're we moved came to california california was this cool hippie kind of area which was opposite of where i came from in florida and um, so 
I, I was being schooled essentially on what the world was like by John. So there came the point, as you mentioned, that um, it became romantic, um, or if you want to call it that, yeah. not romantic, but um, well, like he presented himself as your boyfriend. And in my mind, yeah, and this is important. I'm glad you brought that up because this is a difference with language. It wasn't romantic in the sense that, of the word romance because it really wasn't a relationship in the sense that we, we, you know, so I struggled and I struggled for a lot of years. What do I call this? And I even met many years ago when I first started sharing my story, I said it was, you know, I accepted the idea that people said it was a relationship. And I think I even said it too, because we didn't have any other language. And today I know that the power differential was so different. I've had so much therapy, you know, to unpack and unlearn all of the um, wrong things and the manipulative things that he had taught me um, to think about myself and to think about life. But it was not a relationship. It was a predator and a, and, and a victim. And, and he was I, a pedophile was a pedophile, a predator, and a pimp. And, you know, and that's just the truth. He yeah. knew exactly what he was doing. He was well-versed in seduction. I mean, that was his job, for heaven's sakes, you know? And I was a 15-year-old who had no idea what was going on, nothing. I was just primed for the picking for him. He, sh he could have, you know, and technically in his business, he could have been with anybody. Sure. But he chose a 15-year-old kid that was, you know, struggling with her disabled father and her sister. And that's a predator. And so how, um, and we're not going to go into all, obviously all the details and spoil the book for people because, um, you know, we want you to read it. We couldn't possibly get into it in this short period of time anyway. I mean, it, he was always very controlling. He, you know, he, he would do things like yank my hair or jab me in the ribs or things like that. If I said anything that looked like I was, you know, thinking outside of the box that I was allowed to think in because he was very much in control of everything what I wore, where I went, um, you know, eventually my father left and my sister left and he talked me into staying. Mm -hmm. And I believed that he was my boyfriend because I didn't really know anything else. And he was so in control of everything. I mean, really everything. Um, and that, like I said, the marijuana was there and, mm -hmm. and the control was still there. And um, he, he started to bring cocaine in and that became, I, I would say that became more violent. So he was, he was actually having you go out on the streets of Hollywood and then later uh, back in Florida. And, um, you know, it was human trafficking yeah. because you, you didn't really have a choice. I didn't have a choice. I was forced to go out. I was forced, to, I was told what to wear, what to say. He was always hiding in the hotel room um, to make sure I was doing exactly what I was told. Um, you know, he had to be in control of all of it. He, um, you know, I would beg and cry, please don't do this. Please don't do this. You know, I love you. I don't, you know, I, you know, and I would hope he would change because as anybody who's in a battered situation can understand it, you, it's this cycle of like when he's going to get really violent and then, at, then he, then he is violent. And then, and then there's this calm, you want it to go back to that little calm space because yeah. your brain just can't think. But then all of a sudden he gets triggered by something and you start walking on eggshells and you're, you know, it's coming no matter what you do, no matter what you say. And usually that meant like was a time when he was going to kick me out on the streets. I could tell that was the walking on eggshells time. And I just, the only tools I had to protect myself was to plead and beg with him. Yeah. And, but he did anyway. Um, I did try to run a couple times, um, but was mostly caught and, um, and brought back in. Uh, he never beat me in front of anybody for a long time. Um, and then he did eventually, um, you know, but, and it was all mixed in with his um, cocaine and drug runs. And, um, and because I was with him now, what I know now about human trafficking, see, we didn't have this language back when this was happening. We didn't have this language and understanding about human trafficking and the sale of human beings, and, you know, over and over and over again it was a multi-billion dollar business. We didn't have that understanding of it. It was so much more in the shadows <laughs> as it is, than it is today. But, um, you know, he was dragging me around to these drug deals. And um, today that would be considered that he had labor trafficked me as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we are, we're getting stronger as a country in combating human trafficking. But he had me wait outside of um, the Wonderland gang house many times while he was dealing drugs back and forth. And then um, to the main guy, Eddie Nash, who um, owned a lot of, um, uh, it was a guy that was really, really scary. He owned a lot of clubs and music halls in the Los Angeles area. 
he, everybody was afraid of him. He ran drugs, he ran guns, he laundered money, he did all of those things. Um, and that's public record now. Back in the day, I would have never said that because I would have been, you know, but this is public record now. And, um, and John sold me to him a couple of times as well. July 1st, 1981, the Wonderland murders happened. Your story, how you're involved in that um, is in the book. It's in the movie that uh, Val Kilmer and Kate Bosworth played you. Um, in that movie, of course, it was a movie. The story was different. Um, but what I want to do now is we're going to go to break. And when we come back, I want everyone to know what Dawn is doing these days. And I think you're going to really be impressed. So we'll be right back. 